Welcome to Meteorological Memories of 2015. I'm Greg Carbon, Warning Coordination Meteorologist at the Weather Service Storm Prediction Center in Norman, Oklahoma. This is the 14th annual Meteorological Memories presentation I've done, and what follows is a selection of my 10 most memorable events during the past year. I make no attempt to rank these meteorological events in terms of impact or importance. They all hold some fascination for me for one reason or another, and I'll present these memories in roughly chronological order and hope you enjoy the show. It was a remarkable winter in the Northeast, arguably most remarkable in the city of Boston. After the city buried its all-time snowfall record in early March, the mayor of Boston, Marty Walsh, tweeted, Super Bowls, World Series, Stanley Cups, and snowfall records, we are truly a title city. There will be no parade. Let's take a look at Boston's newly inflated winter records. I put this loop together showing accumulating snowfall from January 1st through March 31st. The total summed accumulation is shown for every five days, and the data came from the National Snow and Ice Center, some missing data across northern Maine. And the amounts are contoured in feet. By March 16th, Boston measured a total seasonal snowfall of 108.6 inches, surpassing the previous snowfall record of 107.6 inches that was set in the winter of 1995 and 1996. On its way to this record, many other snowfall records for Boston melted away, including the city's 5, 7, 10, 20, 30, and 40-day snowfall records, the snowiest February on record, and the fastest period to a 6-foot snowfall record. That one broken in 18 days. Oh, and February was also the coldest month ever recorded in the city of Boston with a mean temperature of only 16.1 degrees Fahrenheit. If I had to pick a single winter storm to best define the 2015 Boston snowstorm Blitzkrieg, it would be this fantastic nor'easter coming at the end of January. This system came about as a strong shortwave trough, moved across the Midwest, and aided with East Coast cyclogenesis uh, along a very strong coastal front with an incredibly cold surface-based air mass centered over New England. The results were a delight to behold for snow and blizzard lovers, and this animation shows the dramatic pressure falls associated with the deepening low pressure as it moved up the coast, and the incredible wind gusts during Monday and Tuesday, January 26th and 27th. The gusts are only plotted at those locations with the visibility at or below one half mile in snow and blowing snow. This was one of the best time lapses posted on the YouTube during the Boston blizzard of 2015, and I've taken the screenshots to show the times to give you an idea of the amazing accumulation that occurred from this one storm. It occurred almost over three days and with considerable snowfall of up to three feet. Also, a lot of coastal flooding with the high winds occurring with this event. The blizzard conditions also caused widespread flight cancellations and power outages, and this map depicts some of the storm totals with the higher amounts, upwards of three feet, falling in eastern Massachusetts. That was just one of the many snow events to bring about the snowiest winter across eastern New England since reliable records began in the 1800s. There were so many pictures of snow, it was hard to pick what to show you here. Fenway was buried, homes were buried and iced up, there were icebergs and slushy waves on Cape Cod and the islands, and there was this nasty pile of dirty snow that continued across central Boston from the snow removal efforts of the winter, and that pile of dirty snow lasting into the month of July. So for memory number one in summary, it was wicked cold for much of the winter across Boston. Temperatures not getting above 40 degrees for a record 43 days during the winter. And then all the snowfall records, snowiest winter, snowiest February, and most consecutive days with snowfall, only a few of the most remarkable snowfall records occurring in Boston in 2015. It should come as no surprise, given the large-scale pattern supporting cold air and snow outbreaks across the central and eastern United States, that severe weather outbreaks were almost non-existent during the first quarter of the year. What may come as a surprise, however, is just how unusual the lack of severe weather was. The first three months of 2015 had only four tornado watches and nine severe thunderstorm watches issued by the Storm Prediction Center. A total of 13 watches through the end of March established a new all-time record low number of watches for any January through March time period since 1970. 
When viewed with respect to departure from normal watches by county during this period, we see portions of the Gulf Coast and lower Mississippi Valley were running about five to six watches below their normal allotment for this time of year. I love the Chikla chart as a display of an enormous amount of information, and it allows us to visualize the numbers and types of watches issued on every day for the months of January, February, and March since 1970 at the bottom to 2015 at the very top of the chart. The y-axis shows the years from 70 to 2015, and the x-axis showing the calendar day for each year through March 31st. This chart makes it easy to visualize the variability in watch issuance and also how watches really start to increase as we move towards spring. But look at 2015 here at the top, only 13 watches, the least number issued for the entire time over the past 46 years. Not only were there very few watches issued, there was this span of 51 days without a watch, which is the longest watch-free stretch of days in 29 years. If we sum the daily watch counts for the 46-year period, we get this chart. It shows that by the end of March, we should normally be standing at a watch count around 80. Also, based on the observed distribution of watch counts through March, since 1970, there's a 99% chance the watch count will be greater than 20 and less than 150. In other words, the 13 watches issued in 2015 were extremely unusual and a very low anomaly and the very lowest in the, in the entire distribution. We can also use that information, uh, the watch count distribution, to estimate the probability of a watch by calendar day. The dark blue line is a smooth probability of at least one watch being issued on that day. And we can see how the chance of a watch being issued really ramps up by the end of March to slightly better than even odds. And if we use the observed probability distribution of daily watch counts, we can assume a steady state climate with no precondition on the daily probability of watches issued. I ran this simulation for 25,000 years and could not replicate the low watch count we experienced in 2015. In fact, the simulation reveals that 2015, with only 13 watches issued through the end of March, was an incredibly anomalous event. Unless something about the character of the cool season severe weather potential has changed or we're undergoing dramatic change in the large scale pattern, such a low number should remain a very rare occurrence. Thus, event number two, a nearly watchless winter is quite memorable. Very anomalous low watch counts. A 51-day stretch was a record span and the longest in 29 years. And it was a record watch-free span in March as well, the first 23 days of the month, seeing no severe thunderstorm or tornado watch issued anywhere in the country. Number three, a seasonal severe weather forecast. While not an actual meteorological event, this is an important event of the year from a forecasting science perspective and deserves an explanation and summary. During March of 2015, if you didn't notice, research scientists working at Columbia University and the International Institute of Climate and Society published the first research forecast for seasonal severe weather activity in the journal Nature Geoscience. John Allen and colleagues developed a probabilistic scheme of severe weather activity occurring during March, April, and May based on an evaluation of the El Nino Southern Oscillation phase occurring in December, January, and February. These maps from their paper show the influence and correlation of the ENSO phase in December, January, February on the atmospheric parameter space in the subsequent March, April, May. Warm phase, El Nino, on the left, and cool phase, La Nina, on the right. The magnitude of each anomaly is indicated by the color fill on the maps, with red for above normal conditions and blue for below normal. And that's 500 millibar heights at the top, mean moisture in the middle, and storm relative helicity at the bottom. The hatching indicates the strength of the correlation with ENSO phase for each of the anomalies. Allen and all authors also developed tornado and hail indices based on environmental reanalysis data, and they've compared these indices with actual storm reports to arrive at a multidimensional data set to compare past events with ENSO phase. From that, they derive a linear relationship between reports, environments, and ENSO phase. The strongest relationship they found exists for the region by encompassed by the dashed rectangle centered on the arc latex, and this is the region for their 2015 seasonal forecast for March, April, and May severe weather. 
based on the Oceanic Nino index value for the months of December, January, February, a regression equation approach is used to derive the probability of subsequent severe weather occurring in March, April, and May in the small region centered on the Arklatex. In late 2014 and early 2015, the ONI, or Oceanic Nino Index, was trending up as the Equatorial Pacific was in a warming phase, or El Nino. The ONI for this period was just under 1, and plotting that value on the categorical probabilities chart gives us the values that we see in the resulting pie chart. The forecast was for slightly greater than even chance for normal levels of severe weather activity in March, April, May when compared to climatology in the region of interest. The chance for below normal activity in the area of interest was slightly greater than the chance of above normal severe weather, 30% versus 10%. When the preliminary March, April, May 2015 hail and tornado events are plotted and compared to prior data, we see that the 2015 event count falls on the outside edge of the warm phase distribution. And these counts are close to normal for climatology in this region. The definition of climatology for the 2015 events is the period 2007 to 2015. And that's a shorter time span than what was used by the authors in their study to derive their index in climatology. They used 1979 through 2012. Another way of looking at severe weather activity is to look at SPC watch counts, similar to what we just looked at for the start of the year. This map depicts the watch count anomaly by county when March, April, May 2015 watches are compared to the mean number of watches issued during these three months since 2003. There's a strong gradient in above normal activity across parts of Texas and western and central Texas in the lower Mississippi Valley. Interestingly, the research forecast happens to straddle this gradient with above normal watches in the west and well below normal in the east. In the mean, that would suggest a close to normal level of activity, but this also reveals some of the challenges involved in developing and verifying extended range forecasts for severe weather. In summary, new ground has been broken in the area of extending severe weather forecasts and look for more to come, uh, research and operations in this area in the not too distant future. The Allen et al. paper is a pioneering way forward and good preliminary verification is expected uh, in this small area and there are challenges with respect to trying to extend this type of forecasting to a larger area or region. Okay, back to memorable, sensible weather. One of the most destructive tornadoes of the year and the highest rated tornado of 2015 tracked across northern Illinois on April 9th. There were some incredible videos of this stunning event as it unfolded into the early evening hours. More than 10 tornadoes were reported across Illinois on this day, but it was this long track EF4 that was on the ground for almost an hour, crossed Interstate 39, and made a direct hit on the small town of Fairdale that got the attention. Information is always sketchy in the immediate aftermath of bad tornadoes, and this was no exception. Later that evening, I found it interesting that I could confirm the actual track of the destructive tornado by looking at the traffic pattern uh, from Google Maps on my phone. The image on the right shows how Route 72 in rural northern Illinois was likely blocked by debris and ongoing rescue efforts in the immediate aftermath of this devastating tornado. The meteorology of the event was not atypical. This is a classic springtime setup for this part of the Midwest. Low pressure was forecast to strengthen while developing east-northeast along a warm front situated over northern Illinois. The conditions were expected to support tornadic supercells as the warm sector destabilized through the afternoon. This is a loop of hourly sea level pressure and storm reports during each hour for the event showing how the deepening low pressure system moved along the warm front and resulted in a number of tornadic storms. The storm scale ensemble guidance available from the Storm Prediction Center, a combination of seven high resolution convection allowing models, shows an exceptional forecast in this case. There was the potential for a very strong, perhaps a couple of very strong rotating storms in the forecast. This is showing the maximum updraft helicity from any of the seven ensemble forecast members for the 24 hour period ending on the morning of April 10th. And while this forecast shows strong potential, it only 
indicates very isolated activity in the simulation. The tornado tracks now shown in red here, along with SPC's significant tornado probability contour. Despite the damage and two fatalities and 22 injuries resulting from this EF4 tornado, I think Chicago was quite relieved that the actual forecast did not verify exactly as shown in the high resolution numerical guidance. And this is an exceptional forecast by the Storm Prediction Center uh, showing the potential for significant tornadoes, but a generally low probability when you look at the overall area that was affected. The larger image here is a Landsat 8 image and clearly reveals the tornado track as a dark line from space. Closer to the surface, the Civil Air Patrol photo shows what the track looked like across the fields and cropland of northern Illinois. The extended outlooks for this event were outstanding. SPC began highlighting severe weather potential across the region six days in advance. And as I mentioned earlier, the photographs and videos were stunning as the tornado formed and moved steadily northeast through the evening. Unfortunately, the damage inflicted to the small town of Fairdale was quite extreme. So for number four, the only EF4 tornado occurring in 2015, the last tornado of this magnitude in Illinois occurred in November of 2013, but the last time a tornado of this intensity occurred close to Chicago is the Plainfield tornado in 1990. Two deaths, 22 injuries, and a 30-mile track for this EF4 tornado in early April. Number five, the wettest month on record for the continental United States. May of 2015 was quite wet. It was the wettest month in 121 years of record keeping, taking the precipitation and spreading it evenly across the United States. The total precipitation for May averaged 4.36 inches. That's 1.45 inches above average. The previous wettest May on record occurred in 1957 with 4.24 inches of precipitation averaged across the continental United States. The previous wettest month occurred more recently, and that was October 2009, with 4.29 inches. But May 2015 will take the new record as the wettest month in 121 years of record keeping. Those continental stats are impressive, but what's even more incredible is the amount of rainfall that occurred across the central U.S. during the month of May. Here is the standardized anomaly plot by climate region, and some areas had over 20 inches of rainfall from April 20th through May 19th. Oklahoma and Texas were swamped by extreme rainfall events during both April and May. Here's the daily accumulation of precipitation for the month of May from the National Weather Service data. From Lubbock to Brownsville and points in between, precipitation measured to date in 2015 was unlike anything anyone could recall before. Records fell in all of these locations as far as monthly and some daily records as well and as the extreme rainfall continued during the month. Similar to the watch count sum chart I showed earlier, here is the observed precipitation sum through May for Oklahoma City. Back to 1891, there are 124 thin green lines in this chart depicting the sum for every year from 1891 to 2014. From this record, the mean Oklahoma City rainfall through May is about 13 inches. In 99 out of 100 years, the May total precipitation for Oklahoma City is somewhere between 6 and 26 inches, except when it's something altogether different, like the nearly 29 inches observed in 2015. Much of May's bounty came on the 6th of the month when over 7 inches was observed at Will Rogers World Airport. This ranked as the third greatest 24-hour rainfall on record and was the greatest daily amount ever recorded during the month of May. So how rare were the rainfall totals for the first five months of the year in Oklahoma City? 
Well, here's another si simulation based on the daily rainfall probability distribution and randomly selecting from that distribution for 5,000 years. Again, assuming no climate change and no preconditioning of the random selection based on the prior day's weather, it appears that rainfall in May 2015 at Oklahoma City was a once in about a thousand year event. And that's just based on this simple simulation where we can only get a few years similar to what we saw this past year at around 29 inches through the month of May. It was wet and wild around the southern plains and especially over central and southern Oklahoma and north Texas. There's the I-35 bridge crossing the Red River and it was almost topped by the Red River. Damage in the Turner Falls area was in the millions of dollars. And oh yeah, heavy rain in Oklahoma and Texas in May does not come unaccompanied. That's uh, many tornadoes and big hail events came along with these rainfall events for good measure. Norman, Oklahoma was smacked repeatedly with floods and severe weather. And even I got a new roof out of the wild weather during the month of May 2015. So we're halfway through this review. Number five, the rainfall records were incredible. An incredibly wet spring in the plains, annual rainfall in one month for some areas, and many all-time precipitation records set. Number six, it's difficult to truly describe the overall stagnancy in the pattern across the western United States in place for well over a year now. I talked about the devastating drought and record heat across California in last year's presentation. Well, guess what? It's gotten even hotter this year. And in fact, from January through September, the entire western United States has experienced its hottest year in more than 120 years. While there have been intermittent episodes of precipitation, those have been nowhere near sufficient to alleviate the disastrous drought. So number six and number seven are related to the drought and heat. There's fires as well, and given the interrelated nature of all of these parameters, I've combined memories number six and seven. There appears to be a distressing upward trend in the mean summertime temperatures across the western U.S. over the last three years. A large area from southern California to northern Idaho saw mean temperature anomalies of two to three degrees above normal summertime temperatures in 2015, the greatest departure in the last three summers. Here's a look at California's January through August mean temperatures since the late 1800s. Clearly, the last two years have pushed into what can only be described as extreme outlier territory. And the drought has worsened over almost all areas of the West in the past 10 months. Extreme drought remains unchanged over most of California, and conditions have worsened over the Northwest, as can be seen in the middle and third panels on this slide. On the far right is the stark information about how much precipitation would be needed to just reach the median accumulated precipitation values for a five-year period. Even if the coming year is the wettest year on record in the San Joaquin Valley, the agricultural center of the state, that region's precipitation deficit would only rise out of the bottom 20% on record. To reach the 50th percentile or median in five-year precipitation total, the south coast of California would need 300% of normal precipitation, 53 inches of rain, and that would be 15 inches more than ever observed in the wettest water year on record. And then there are the fires. I put this map together in an attempt to view how states have been impacted by megafires. Those are fires burning at least 10,000 acres over the past five years. Idaho, with the largest pie chart, leads western states in acreage burned by megafires since 2011. Most of the acreage lost to those fires occurred in 2012, the orange slices on the pie charts. In fact, 2012 was the worst year for megafires in a majority of western states, except for Arizona and New Mexico, where 2011 was particularly bad. Those are the blue slices. For California, Idaho, and Montana, 2015 saw the second greatest loss in acreage due to megafires since 2011. Oregon's second greatest loss occurred last year, the green slice, but 2015 has been comparable. Washington state had an extremely busy summer for large fires with 1 million acres burned, by far the greatest loss from megafires in recent years for that state. 
Heat, fire, and drought seem to have become the unfortunate norm in the West. There's a loop of MODIS satellite fire detections from late June through August, a low-altitude fire retardant dump over California, a look at how snow cover or lack of it across the Yosemite Valley has changed since 2011, and the dried-out bottom of an empty California reservoir. In summary, I don't have a lot of good news. The drought continues across the West, and that is aggravated by ongoing above normal temperatures and unfortunately many fires during the wildfire season. This is the warmest record, warmest year on record, drought recovery not in sight, and extreme and extensive wildfire activity. Number eight, a place where rain brought more misery than relief late this summer was southern Utah, specifically the small Mormon enclave of Hilldale, as well as nearby Zion National Park. A deadly flash flood hit these areas on September 14th. There were actually two catastrophes resulting from the convective deluge in this relatively remote area near the border with northern Arizona. Seven canyon explorers were swept away in a flash in Zion National Park, at least 12 others, including children, lost their lives as floodwaters washed vehicles they were in off the road and down in Engorge Creek in Hilldale, Utah. The equation for this flash flood tragedy is pretty simple. In the month leading up to the event, precipitation was well above normal. About twice the normal rainfall was observed in the area in August. And then the area's topography also played a role in funneling the downpours and enhancing the stream flow. Combined with the saturated air mass, precipitable water at the upstream Flagstaff, Arizona station was near the 90th percentile for the time of year, and a series of mid-level disturbances timed preferentially with daytime heating re resulted in episodic afternoon thunderstorms which formed over the region. And the storms passed across the same area with around about an inch of total rainfall, perhaps locally a bit more. The results were unfortunate and devastating. So number eight, deadly flash flooding in southern Utah. Twice as many fatalities occurred in this rogue southwest flash flood event than all the tornado fatalities in 2015 combined. Also, the isolated heavy rain over an incredibly small area claimed about as many lives on this September day as all the lives lost from flooding in the next more recent memory. In closing out this year's review, how can we not pay homage to this epic event? No Rotten Tomatoes for this weather premiere, as the atmosphere's performance rose to critical acclaim. But of course, and again, that means there's suffering and loss as well. Number nine, Hurricane Joaquin and the South Carolina rain. Here is a midnight shift map I did early Friday morning, October 2nd. You see Hurricane Joaquin moving into the Bahamas at this time, about ready to give the Bahamas 18 hours of hurricane force winds and rain. And then the strong coastal front aligned with the southeast U.S. coast and then all the way up to the New England coastal waters. The pressure difference across this map is 100 millibars between the high pressure just north of Lake Superior and Hurricane Joaquin moving into the Bahamas. The intensifying onshore flow and considerable fetch acted to pile up a lot of water along the eastern seaboard. And it was getting a bit loopy at the end of my shift, but I happened to look at a couple of buoy observations here. And it was amazing to see the wave heights increase from 6 to 18 feet overnight. Just huge waves immediately east of Delmarva in Cape May, New Jersey. The variety and uncertainty of the many hurricane track forecasts was also a consequence of the complexity of this pattern. You can see that here in the static water vapor image, just an incredibly anomalous situation with a deep closed low forming over Florida and the offshore tropical system. And then the extensive radar loop here showing the fire hose of tropical rain across South Carolina for almost three days straight. Once established, the fire hose was barely moving and pivoted across portions of central and northeast South Carolina where the heaviest rainfall amounts occurred. 
It's still su stunning to see what transpired uh, in this historic precipitation event will be remembered for quite some time. Amazing amounts over a couple of days of 20 to 26 inches of rainfall in South Carolina. This map courtesy of the Capital Weather Gang. There's a before and after shot in the upper right there near Columbia, South Carolina, a map of the road and bridge closure, closures across South Carolina and the coastal flooding in Charleston. And while the center of Hurricane Joaquin never made it close to the coast, it was uh, indicated in some track forecasts to come quite close, but never happened. The influence of this tropical cyclone was no doubt felt and poorly absorbed across South Carolina. In summary, number nine, Joaquin and the South Carolina rain, another equation for heavy rainfall, tropical weather with jets and topography equal a thousand year or more rainfall event, 21 deaths in North Carolina, South Carolina, that was as of mid-October, hundreds of dam failures and major road damage, especially centered over middle portions of South Carolina for this event. And finally, event number 10 for meteorological memories of 2015. This event coming along right around the middle of November, a very rare High Plains tornado outbreak on November 16th. The map here shows how unusual it is to see tornadoes in this part of the country during this time of the year. And overall, there were widespread tornado reports from the Texas Panhandle northward across western Kansas, a highly unusual event for November 16th. Here are the anomaly charts uh, for the pattern that was in place uh, on November 16th. These come from the NCEP NCAR reanalysis page at the uh, NOAA website and show the 500 millibar anomalies in the upper left and the precipitable water anomalies in the upper right and then the wind speed anomalies in the lower panels for 500 millibars and 850 millibars, the lower levels of the atmosphere respectively. And we see a very, very deep and anomalous trough across the western U.S., very high precipitable water across the southern plains feeding into this area of the country where instability is usually un rare or difficult to achieve in late November or even middle November. The wind speeds at 500 millibars upwards of 50 knots above normal coming across uh, southern western portions of the continental United States and into the southern high plains. And then the low-level jet anomaly there in the lower right at uh, nearly 40 knots or 20 meters per second above the long-term climatology for this time of year. So conditions were very favorable for the development of severe thunderstorms across this area, even though the time of year or the calendar said it was not a favorable time. Looking at the long loop here, water vapor on the left and a accumulation of radar reflectivity on the right shows the evolution of this system during the daytime hours and through the night from 18 UTC on 16th of November through the next morning 12 UTC on the 17th of November. And the upper trough comes out. There was very strong heating across the High Plains area, which enabled instability to build. And then the large-scale forcing with the trough and the intense shear produced the environment favorable for numerous strong tornadoes. In fact, the preliminary count across this area is at 35, an enormous number of tornadoes for mid-November. Uh, there were three EF3 tornadoes, two occurring in the Texas Panhandle, one in southwest Kansas. And the southwest Kansas EF3 tornado tracked for over 50 miles, the longest tracked tornado in modern records back to 1950 across this area of the country during the month of November. Here's an indication of what the storm summaries look like for the multi-radar, multi-sensor data. Uh, the upper left there showing the reports and then overlaid and flashing on the reports, the rotation tracks from the MRMS data. A 24-hour summary on the right of mesh tracks or max estimated size hail along with the LSRs for large hail. Uh, red indications on this map, the red pixels indicating where hail might be upwards of two inches in diameter and then the circles being the actual local storm reports. 
And then finally, in the middle there, an evaluation of how well some of the forecast guidance from the storm scale ensemble tracks the max updraft helicity tracks over the 24-hour period combined with where tornado warnings were occurring late in the afternoon on November 16th. These maps show how rare this event was. Uh, this is uh, the large map showing the total number of EF3 and stronger tornadoes uh, for the last 30 years from 1985 to 2014. The higher numbers concentrated across the lower Mississippi Valley with very isolated events occurring in the Midwest. Only one indicated in the past 30 years across western Kansas. So we'll be adding a few numbers to this map and that's where uh, we see the number two there for the two F3 tornadoes and the single tornado EF3, the long track tornado in western Kansas. And speaking of long track, the inset map shows the number of tracks 51 miles or greater from November and December back to 1950, showing how anomalous a long track tornado in Kansas is based on this long term record. Some of the images from the event just striking. Uh, late in the day on November 16th, 2015, uh, Pampa, Texas damage there in the eastern Texas panhandle from an EF3 tornado, a highly unusual event leading up to just before Thanksgiving. So number 10, closing out 2015, the High Plains tornadoes of November, an unprecedented event for Kansas and the Texas panhandle. Powerful storms continued through the night with high winds in parts of Oklahoma and the longest November tornado track on record for the state of Kansas. And there you have it, meteorological memories of the past year, numbers 1 through 10. And I hope you enjoyed the program, and thank you very much for your attention.